indeed, I'm going to talk about a thing called, that I have named the Phi Top. Let's start off without any further ado. There it is. That's an image of it, at least. That's an image of my daughter taking a picture of it. It's a prolate ellipsoid with a very special design that I'll talk about. And um, before I talk about the Phi Top, why would a physicist be here talking about an actual physical object and its physical properties? Why aren't I talking about math? Well, you'll see in a minute why I think it's appropriate for the gathering for Gardner. In preparing, oh, and just to say, I'll, I'll give some background about what the physics is a little bit, how I developed it, a little about the golden mean that's suspect in my world, but it flies around here, and then some other, uh, at this time, properties of the object. So why is it appropriate to talk about this at the gathering? You know, Martin Gardner seemed to have a, a real fascination with eggs, and I, I discovered more and more of it um, in preparing for this little presentation. The last recreations, what's featured right up in the front here? Hydras, eggs, and other things. Once I gave a talk up here about spinning tops, and I did something with raw eggs and hard-boiled eggs, and that's how you know the difference. You can actually spin the egg if it's hard-boiled, and it will stand up. Martin went further. He talked about that in lots of little physics articles that he wrote in a thing called the Physics Teacher of the American Journal of Physics and elsewhere. Maybe you didn't know he published physics. This is a magic trick he would do with it. If you, could if you take a non-hard-boiled egg and spin it, after it stops moving, it can actually counter-rotate because the fluid can pick up the shell and move in the opposite direction. And he turned that into a magic trick, which he discusses in uh, The Last Recreations. He wrote a fair bit about Pete Hines' super egg, and many of you may know about this, but it's an object that's based on the Lame curve that Pete Hines devised in 1965 or so, sold very successfully. Instead of having an ellipsoid, the index n is not uh, 2, but something else. And he chose 2.5, and the parameters in here, 4 thirds. Why, I don't have a clue. But if there's a petine aficionado in here, I'd love to know why he picked those parameters. This object has the property that it has no flat sides on it, and yet it will stand up stably. And uh, we could talk about that if people are interested in the physics. Martin Gardner loved to debunk things. And uh, one of the things that he loved to debunk was something that occurred last week and was on NPR. Anybody happen to hear the story about the equinox and the eggs standing up? So this has been around since World War II. Um, it nominally started up with the Chinese standing up eggs on supposedly on the equinox, but actually it was a Chinese holiday that comes in February. But no matter, it was picked up in Life magazine. Einstein commented on it and said it's ridiculous. And, uh, uh, ever since, people do celebrate on the equinox. Can I stand up eggs? Um, we can talk about more of that. And someone, a plant in the audience, is going to ask later on about Tesla's egg of Columbus. So let me give you some background for what I'm up to here. There's a problem which dates back about 150 years, that if you spin an object, it doesn't have to be an egg, just a rock, it'll stand up if you have a flat surface and if it's not too rough, a rock. So this rise of the center of mass was a problem dates back a long time, and as far as I can tell, again, correct, correct me if someone, uh, Lord Kelvin, well, he wasn't Lord Kelvin when he was 22, he was <laughs> William Thompson, but <laughs> Lord Kelvin um, is the first one to have written about this problem. He didn't get anywhere, he did use pebbles, but he did become Lord, well, fine. There are natural objects that are called lingam stones. If you look at the pictures here, you can figure out why they're called lingam stones. And they, when they're spun, will stand direct. After all, that's what they're supposed to do. And we can talk about them. They're a natural object, goes back possibly a long time, or maybe they're fakes made by Indians to sell to Western tourists. After um, William Thompson, by then he was Lord Kelvin, a, another well-known physicist named John Gillette uh, worked on this problem. He got so interested in it that he wrote an entire book called uh, The Theory of Friction because friction is involved in having a spin, spinning op, uh, object stand up. And we'll do the demos in a moment. But uh, you, you can see he didn't really get very far. So his second book is called The Efficacy of Prayer. <laughs> the next event in this story occurred in 1891. Uh, a woman named Helene Spurl, 
only known to historians of this subject, but patented her Wunderkreisel. And this is the basis for what, well, according to many articles, is the basis of the tippy top. Actually, if you make any of these, none of these will actually stand up and invert as the tippy top does. And we'll talk about that. And anyway, she didn't renew the patent and it disappeared. A tippy top, many of you have seen, you spin it and it inverts and stands up. So what do these kind of objects have in common? Well, they have friction, they're spinning, maybe two kinds of friction, rolling friction, sliding friction. The subject of tops and spinning objects in general starts up with someone who is beloved to all of you from the Klein bottle, Felix Klein, great hero in mathematics in the 19th century, tremendously powerful, and he gave a lecture at Princeton on spinning tops. Well, he couldn't get very far, so he gets a smart postdoc, Sommerfeld. Sommerfeld is supposed to write up the notes, but at 14 years later, four volumes, a thousand pages, Sommerfeld is still working on it with him. They couldn't touch what we're going to talk about today. They can only do the simplest symmetric tops. Sommerfeld, though, had an interest. Here you see Niels Bohr, and he gave Niels Bohr one of the tippy tops. You can see, ah, here's Pauli, uh, Pauli and uh, Sommerfeld, and he gave Pauli one, and Pauli's looking for it. Well, it was reinvented about 1950. It swept the world. And here you see Niels Bohr, Pauli, playing with the tippy top. That isn't a faked image. That really is the case. And here's Niels Bohr explaining how it works to the king of Sweden. <laughs> For those of you, and a few people have asked me about this, Euler's disk, rattlebacks, they're related phenomena. I would love to talk about them. In a nutshell, the theory of this subject has gotten nowhere because it involves friction, and we don't have really proper theories of friction. And as far as you guys are concerned, that as mathematicians, even at the level of Smale, is Conway here? I don't think even Conway could deal with this. Um, these are what are called non-holonomic systems, and you can't really do any calculations. So being an ignorant physicist, I said, OK, I'll do some experiments. This was about a year ago. And I took rocks. That's a rock from my son's garden. Various stones that these are these uh, uh, lingam stones. Various kinds of natural objects and polished objects spun them. After doing a bunch of experiments with them, I said, ah, I better do this scientifically. It's got to be science here. So I made uh, a bunch of things near to this, prolate ellipsoids. Well, at least I have a defined function. So here's a, a ellipsoidal shape. After fooling around with the ones I 3D printed, made on CN machine, CNC machines and so forth, what I found was the following. That the most effective object that acted in an interesting way had a ratio of the length to the width of this prolate ellipsoid of a, between 1.5 and 1.7. Now, if we can switch for a moment to the, um, yes, tickle me Elmo. So uh, you see my hand here. You see the scale size for this object. The specific size was set by machining questions. Anybody's interested? You set the thing down, and you can spin it. It stands up. It'll stand up for six minutes. On my website for the Phi Top, we'll talk about in a moment, I have videos of all of this. It does many interesting things. It's not scale dependent. Um, this is made so that it can be a product, but here's a rugby ball. So here's a rugby ball. And if I do it well enough, let's see if I can get this going here. You ever know that rugby balls do that? Footballs don't, but rugby balls do. Um, so. Uh, Lou, <laughs> play with it. You'll have, no, have fun with it, Lou. Spin it on the table. It'll work. As I say, it's scale independent. I can have a big one here. I do it hard enough. There we go. Then it'll stand up. In fact, if you were if a big elephant, any size will do. Uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, not WIFI, but Wi-Fi. Well, it came out between 1.5 and 1.7, and eh, 1.6, eh, it'll sell better as 1.618. <laughs> there is something separate, just in case any of you really feel any of this. I actually did experiments with Harvard students and others, and at BU. What shape do you like? Uh, with a lot of ellipses and so forth. And there is a preference for phi. We can talk about it. Uh, Three by five cards, many other things. One minute. Half a minute. 
So I've shown you a demonstration of this object in action. It includes a number of other properties. That is, if you spin it fast enough, it'll stand up. If I spin it and it's standing up, I can make it sit down by bringing a magnet next to it. And the aluminum is not magnetic. Let's do about that. What I just demonstrated, and I'll ha I have a planted question to get more time, um, is why we have AC electricity. There are related objects, as I say, this is a nice wood version of the spy top. This is a thing that's close to the Meisner object that is a, a body of constant width. That's Pete Hines' um, super egg. So the summary. Uh, a new object here has been devised or designed or discovered. Well, chickens and dinosaurs did it first. But what I mean is, uh, anyway, it's been fabricated. I've, I've optimized it. They didn't optimize it. If you want to see more about it, there's a nice website up, lots of movies and inf information. But even more, at the break, rush to the sales room and buy phytops for you, your friends, your grandchildren, your mother-in-law, whoever. Little kids like it. Big people like it. You can see everybody's cheering. This is, see how excited everybody is? So <laughs> come upstairs and join me later. Thank you. Ah, yes, we want to work in one more thing. It's sneaky, isn't it, David? <laughs> to bring in all of Martin Gardner's interest, let me also bring in uh, another issue, which I haven't brought up yet, puzzles. But in a nutshell, in case you don't know the story of the egg of Columbus, a very famous story. It doesn't start with Columbus. It's dated to 50 years earlier, but let's forget it. The idea is that Columbus comes back from the voyage, He's an Italian. The Spanish princes don't like him. Ah, he's just an Italian. Ah, if you hadn't discovered America, we would have discovered it next year. So uh, Columbus says, oh, yeah? Takes out an egg and stand it up. Nobody can. He taps it on the bottom. See? Stands up. They said, ah, we could have done that. And he says, but you didn't. So this is the story of the egg of Columbus. Now, what's the importance of this for this thing here? Tesla when he's slugging it out with Edison over whether we should have AC or DC, was a showman. And he needed to have a really good demo to show why AC is superior to DC. They had already had fights, but he needed to sell it to JP Morgan, for example, to back him. And so here now is the demonstration, which is why actually, literally, we have AC to this day. What Tesla did was he made under, underneath here an AC three phase, if it means anything to you, rotating magnetic field. I'm, I'm slightly cheating over here. I have a magnetic stirrer, but it's the same demo. It's not touching the, the egg. Oh, sorry. Uh, we need to go to Tickle Me Elmo. Sorry. Can we switch to Tickle Me Elmo? Thank you. So I'm not spinning it. It's the mystical void spinning it up. So underneath it, there's a rotating magnetic field. Stands up. Now, if this was 1893 at the Columbian Exposition, the whole world fell over seeing this demo. And Westinghouse backed Tesla. And that's why we have AC to this day. Switch back for one moment. The last transparency. Sorry? Somebody doubting that? You can doubt me. To bring in the last of, of the interest that is supposed to be here, that is uh, puzzles. When this demo was done at the Columbian Exposition in 1893, this is the apparatus. This is what was done there. It was the most successful, fantastic thing in Chicago, 1893. Some of you who are the puzzlers know about this thing over here. This is Columbus's, the Egg of Columbus puzzle. It's a puzzle that has uh, trick moving parts in it in a certain sense. I don't know. I asked Rick before. Did this concept ever exist prior to the Columbian Exposition? But the last thing of, then of the interest here is this also leads to the, this Egg of Columbus puzzle. Thank you. All right.